That wasn't so. Well, yeah. That wasn't so bad, was it? Who drew me a picture? Because no? the best ones I put on Facebook, even the really offensive ones. If I'm going to it, that's fine. I can take it. All right, we're almost at the end. We only have two new things in this course. Two new things. One new thing is today, and the next new thing is next class. After that, we have a review, and maybe we'll cancel the last class. Maybe we're not supposed to be happy about that. So we're online now. That's good. And we have viewers. So one more announcement before I start. Um, it'll be another quick question today. So is um, some of you may be interested in a career in epidemiology. I'm an epidemiologist. I sold you on the benefits of epidemiology in the past. If you're considering on Thursday night, we're having a special info session for the fourth year students on how to apply to epidemiology grad school. And if you want to attend, you're more than welcome to come. It's at FSS 1007 at 5.30. I'll put a link up on the, uh, on the website below. Uh, if you can't make it and you want to attend, we'll also be streaming it on YouTube because we have that technology. And you can again, tweet questions as we do usually. And afterwards, we'll be at the Cafe Nostalgica for some drinks so you can meet some real live epidemiologists if you want. And uh, I think it's never too late to start thinking about your potential career paths, right? So. Um, and that's probably the only health science non-medical profession 100% of work. And everyone loves epidemiologists because we're good looking at smart. <laughs> oh, you know what? I'm not talking into the microphone. That's a problem. Okay, sorry, YouTube people. Uh, all of that was not covered on YouTube. So um, whatever I just said, I'll put on the website. Ah. Okay. Uh, all right, so today we're going to talk about multiple regression. I've alluded to multiple regression in the past. Let me click this on here. Check all of you. Okay, you still hear me, yeah? You still mic'd? Okay, good. So I've alluded to multiple regression in the past, and it is one of the standard, most powerful uh, technique used when we're looking at a variety of variables, how they might affect a certain outcome. The outcome in this case has to be a continuous variable, like a ratio or interval level variable. And it's a lot like linear regression, but just a little more complicated. It's multi-dimensional linear regression. But first, let's review again, as we always do. Um, first, we talked about ranked correlation. That was a Spearman's row. We talked about unranked correlation. That's a Pearson's row. So one of these two has a close association linear regression. Do you remember which one it is? Spearman or Pearson? I get me straight. Who thinks it's Spearman? Who thinks it's Pearson? All right. Who doesn't know? Who's too afraid to? All right, good. So it's it's Pearson's. Remember that. So Pearson's is the one that has the close association with linear regression. This one doesn't. This one actually a little more robust. In practice, I like to use Spearman's because it measures a variety of different kinds of relationships, not just a straight line, but a monotonic relationship. But because um, Pearson's correlation coefficient measures linearity. It has a close relationship with linear regression, which is all about linearity. But when do we use ranked correlation, the one that measures a monotonic relationship? We measure it when one of our variables is ordinal, um, or the ranges are really dramatically different. What does dramatically different mean? It depends who you ask. Just keep in mind that the ranges are extreme. Like looking again at, uh, um, I can't think of anything. Ah, e, u, ah. IQ score, probably ranging from anywhere between 100 to 140 in a given population, and you're, you're correlating that to age, you can range from 0 to 100. So the two ranges there are quite distinctly different. So uh, a ranked correlation is appropriate. When well, we have extreme outliers, so these conditions compel us to perhaps choose Spearman's correlation over Pearson's correlation. So how do you do a ranked correlation? Well, you rank the subjects first. And then you just do the computational procedure, as, as I taught you. It's essentially doing a Pearson's correlation on the ranks. The trick, though, is to figure out how to rank, the order of the ranking. And this is the human component. So in previous iterations of this class, we didn't give you marks for attending the lab. The lab was just for your own personal fun. And I gave you assignments instead, the big data uh, analysis assignments. And one of the analysis assignments usually involves doing a series of correlations, ranked correlations. And there was a trick to it. The trick was there was a human component where the individual had to figure out what was the logical way to do the ranking. If you just let the computer or the math do the job, you'll get a slightly wrong answer. So we'll do a 
I think we're here. So here's, let's say we're trying to figure out the relationship between how long an inmate stays in prison and their uh, attitude score. So maybe we thought we expect that people with good attitudes will actually not get in trouble in prison and will have early release. People with bad attitudes will pick fights in prison and have a horrible time and they'll have a longer stay there. So our hypothesis is that there's going to be a correlation between shorter stay, uh, better attitudes and shorter stay in prison. So our attitude score is based on a psychiatric test, let's say, that we're giving from 0 to 100. 100 means good attitude and 0 means you're a crappy person. Right? And all the time in prison will be months. So here's our data. Again, hypothetical data. Uh, and for the sake of multiculturalism, throwing Raul there. So, you know, and they're all dudes. Look at that. That's sexist. Because women don't go to prison. No. So, attitude scale. So, uh, who is this? Raul's doing really well attitude. He's got a great, great uh, attitude. And look at that. He spends the least amount of time in prison. So, suddenly, my father's making sense. Who's got the worst attitude? Dan. He's an asshole. Right? And he spends <laughs> lots of time in That's where he belongs. And Bob is kind of in the middle. He's got, you know, moderate attitude. He's got a moderate attitude. So suddenly it's kind of making sense. So if we were to do an unranked correlation, a Pearson's correlation, right, it would look like this. Do it on FPSS, and we find out there's a minus 0.8 correlation. That's a high number. It's close to 1. So clearly there's something going on there. But it also means it's negative. So it's an inverse relationship. If I were to um, graph it, it would look like this. Here are my four points. Here is Raul, and here's Dan. Uh, no, opposite. Yeah, here's yeah, there's Dan Raul, and clearly there's an inverse relationship as attitude gets better, uh, time in prison gets less. Okay, makes sense. If I were to do the ranked version, the Spearman's correlation, I would just simply have to rank my scores. So, who's got the best attitude scale? Well, Raul's got the best one. He's number one. Number two would be Frank, and so forth. Right? Makes sense. Who's got the least amount of time in prison? Well, that's Raul as well, and so forth. Now, this is interesting. Remember I talked about last time that the computer, if you let the computer do the work, it would rank the largest number as number one all the time, and the smallest number as the last one all the time. So the computer would put Dan as being number one instead of Raul, because it doesn't realize that we're, our con concept of ranking is different here. That's the, the human qualitative component. So suddenly the direction is going to change. Right, so I do difference in ranks, I square them, I plug them into my uh, rank correlation coefficient uh, uh, formula, and I get 0.8. Okay, that's the right answer. In fact, if I do it on the computer, it has to be assessed, it gives me minus 0.8. So again, the computer doesn't know how to, it knows how to rank, it doesn't know what you mean by best and worst. So I'm, I'm kicking a dead horse there, but you get the point of course that the human component has to be the person who asks the hypothesis or the research question and figures out the direction of the ranking. Right? So how you rank is important. Now, as we mentioned in the past, you could do significance testing for everything. We did significance testing for straight line equation last time, for the slope, whether the slope was zero or not. We can do the same thing for a correlation coefficient. So with a correlation coefficient, we're saying that there's zero correlation. That's my null hypothesis. So the alternative is going to be there's some correlation. Here's the thing. There's never zero correlation. It's also rare to find zero correlation. If I dig deep, I can always find some correlation. So this is actually a pointless exercise. But we're going to do it anyway, just to show you that we can do it. But it's, again, it's pointless. So we just computed a row, 0.8. Does it automatically mean we reject the null? Conceptually, probably. That's such a high number. I would even bother doing this nonsense. That's a high number. Yeah, something's going on here. But we're going to run through the mechanics anyway to show you that this is nonsensical at times. So what we do, we look up the critical value at the back of the book, page 420, and we find for alpha 0.5 and our sample size of 5, we should get a row of 1. We haven't got 1. Our book value is bigger than our value, so that means we fail to reject it. Okay? So essentially, essentially doing it this way tells us that our correlation is 0. So this way is meaningless. So sometimes doing hypothesis testing really has no particular value in the world, in my opinion. I can back that up. So um, the summary there is correlation coefficients and linear regressions. Doing significance testing for the value of the slope and the value of, of the correlation coefficient doesn't have a lot of value. The actual value of the slope and the actual value of the 
correlation coefficient is what we care about. All right, so here, the 0.8 is we, we care about. By the way, SPSS gives us the value as well, 0.2. It tells us right away it's not significant. So if you didn't know statistics, if you just knew to find p-values, you would, you would look at this, p-value is 0.2, it's not low, the null does not go. And you would fail to reject the null and conclude that, that 0.8 is meaningless. But it's not meaningless. It's good. It's a good number. It's a fine correlation. Right. That's what I'll say about that. Moving on. We looked at linear regression last time. Remember that our A or alpha is the y-intercept, our B or beta is the slope, and uh, the equation rate line was that. Uh, all the stuff in high school you remember. And we did the regression equation where we predict what a straight line would look like based upon a sample set of model data that compress a bunch of scattered plotty points into something resembling a straight line. And y prime is what we're trying to predict using actual values. So again, here, maybe we're predicting how much time it's been in prison based upon what you got in your attitude score. So I use a bunch of prisoners from another prison to run a model, and I got you as my new prisoners to figure out how long you're going to be in prison based upon this model. Okay? Fill this up last time. And let's look at the same guys. Top rank, we're moving in. Here's the attitude curves, and I'm going to use this as my model, as a data to develop a linear regression model. We saw already from the scatter plot that the relationship is linear. We saw we, we had a, an R of 0.8, that's pretty high, so we know we're going to get a very good equation already. So, what we want is time in prison predicted by an intercept plus a slope multiplied by attitude score. I'm going to predict time in prison based upon how well you score on your attitude test. Think about this. This would be amazing if we could do this. This is real. Every time you convict a prisoner, you give them a psych test, and this is how long you're going to spend in prison. If only the world worked like this. And it sort of does, as we'll see when we move into multiple regression. So maybe the biggest thing predicting your time in prison is that. But we know that there are other things predicting your time in prison as well, including the crime we committed, <laughs> including the deal that you, you negotiated, including probably your race, <laughs> including you know probably other things like that. So there are all kinds of factors here that we're going to throw in. That would be great if we can predict this based upon just one one. Again, that's our plot. We know it looks like a straight line, sort of. So we're going to get a straight line equation. That looks like this. Is that a negative or positive, by the way? It's a negative slope. Right? So we know it's going to be a minus bx plus a negative bx. Right, so like last time, we're going to fill in our spreadsheet, right? We have our average x's, we have our average y's, we have our, our individual points minus our averages, individual points minus our averages, we got our x squared, our xy's, we fill up all this, and we just plug in our numbers to get our a's and b's. So our beta is minus 0.7, which makes sense, that's our slope, and our alpha is 64, which makes sense, it's positive. So that's my regression equation. I'm sorry if I'm going fast. I assume it's a review at this point. It's just plugging in numbers into your spreadsheet. Right? So this is my equation now. This means I can predict a time in prison using this equation here, where x is your attitude score. Fantastic, magical. We've solved criminal justice in Canada. Everything is great. Okay. So that's the official thing. What are my units here? Well, the units are going to be whatever the units were that I used in my analysis. So let's say I was using months before. So now I'm using months. Right? Which is the independent and dependent variables here? Remember? You know, stuff from first semester and the exam is not cumulative, so you've probably forgotten all this stuff already. Do you remember? Dependent. What depends on what? Yeah? Um, independent is your attitude and dependent is your attitude. Your attitude. Yeah, that's right. That's great. So, <laughs> so that's uh, independent, that's free to be whatever it wants, and this depends on that. Okay, so if I were to do the linear regression using SPSS, I would get this output. What this shows me is my beta is the slope, is 63.7, and the alpha is going to be minus 6.7. There it is. Oh, sorry, other around, other around, sorry. Uh, um, the slope is minus 0.67, and the uh, alpha is 63. There it is. Great. Perfect. Okay. So we'll see. We're going to predict how long some individual is going to be in prison. So 
uh, someone who is convicted of a crime, they score 43 on their test. I plug in 43 into here, and I get 35.2 months. So I know I can predict how long I'm going to be in prison. Fantastic. So how good is that line? How good is that model? We could do a significance test like we did last time to see if the slope equals zero, or we can apply a variety of goodness of fit statistics. Every time we do a regression analysis of any kind, and as you move through your, your careers, you'll do linear regressions, multiple regressions, logistic regressions, binomial regressions, Poisson regressions, meta regressions, so many regressions, you're probably depressed to bring about them right now. But every time you do one, you can do a goodness of fit test to see how good the model was that you created. In other words, how well does it actually predict things that things to predict? We also have the R squared that we can use. Which row do you think that is? Pearson's pyramid. That's an R. You know, R's are always correlation coefficients. Which one is it? Pearson. Why is it Pearson? <laughs> That's a good answer. It is because you remember it that way. That's correct. It is because, remember, Pearson's is the unranked one, and unranked correlations measure linearity. The right correlations measure monotonicity. Monotonicity is when we're measuring if it keeps on going up and going down together, not whether it's a straight line. So linear regression, clearly, there's an association with a linear correlation, which is Pearson's. Okay. So remember, we also talked about residual. Residuals is the, um, the error that each pitted point has, because they're not precisely on a straight line, a little bit off the straight line. So each point will be a different distance from a straight line. And we um, get that from looking at the predicted y model, okay, which are these values here. And we subtract the predicted y from our actual y from our data. Okay. We square it. That's our residual, or residual squares, rather. We can sum them all up. We can plug them into our r squared equation, and we can actually compute Our Pearson correlation coefficient. Yeah. Amazing. We can do that backward. It's fantastic. Yeah. We did that already last time. How do we interpret R squared? Well, remember when we looked at correlation coefficient, we could interpret R using this box, this little tool here. Again, this is just one way. There are hundreds of, well, scores of ways of doing it. Everyone agrees the higher the R, the better the linearity. In general, if you got somewhere between you know, 0.7 and 0.9, that's a high correlation. Our R here is 0.84. That's pretty high. R squared is a little harder. R squared, you said, if it's greater than 0.6, then it's probably a good fit. And what does R squared measure again, supposedly? Do you remember? R is linearity. R squared is the question you asked me. Okay. Sorry? Not variance, but it's close. Variability close. Yeah. Even closer. So it's the proportion of, uh, of variance that this variable explains in the other, in terms of the relationship. Very close. So you can also think about it as a percentage. It's a percentage of variance. So the higher it is, then the more that this variable explains that variable. If it was 100%, if it was 1.0, that means that attitude is perfectly predictive of, of time in jail. If it's 0.9, then attitude is 90% predictive of time in jail. Here, it's, point, it's whatever, 0.8 is where it is. Is that? <laughs> That's pretty high anyway. That's that percentage of how, how much uh, attitude score explains the variation in time in jail. Okay, now let's move on for a bit. Let's say you want to create a statistical model that has You get high scores? And R squared? Yeah, you're not gonna find No, it's possible. It's possible. It's um in practice, depending on the research you do, you tend to get things around 0.5 ish. You know, and, and um in big uh trials like when we look at multiple multiple it's even harder, I get excited for 0.4 and 0.5. Okay. But 0.6 is damn good. Anything higher than that, you you call your mom and celebrate. Right? It's pretty good. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's why that the cutoff for for good is 0.6, whereas just R the cutoff for good was 0.6. Then you square it, it gets less. Yes, good point. 
All right, so let's say we're going to create a model now to predict your GPA based upon just your English mark. All right, so let's say it's a linear relationship. Um, you would use learning regression. So GPA equals alpha plus beta times your English mark. Straightforward. But let's say you want to use a variety of criteria to compute your GPA. Clearly, your GPA is not based upon just one mark. It's based upon several marks. Um, so let's say you're going to base it on your English mark, your physics mark, and your calculus mark. Again, this is not your actual GPA. It's your predicted GPA for the rest of the year. So we have a multiple regression, we call this. So here we have just the English mark. Here we have the English plus the physics mark plus the calculus mark. Look at this relationship. It's not a straight line anymore because we have one, two, three independent variables. How do I graph three independent variables? I can. I can graph two independent variables on you know, three different axes, x, y, and z. Once I get one more axis into the realm of multi dimensions, <coughs> the mind starts to work. Okay? So we can't really visualize this all that well. But we talked about in the past that, um, that even though there are three independent variables here, it's still a linear relationship. Why is it a linear relationship? Say the word linear. Remember? Yeah. The order, exactly. It's order of magnitude. So each of these are still just an order of magnitude of one. So the exponent of each of these is one. Nothing squared, nothing's cubed. So long as the highest exponent is one, it's a linear relationship still. So this is called multiple linear regression, even though it in no way resembles a straight line. Okay? So what is this? This is multiple linear regression. Uh, and it's because we call it the factors that are combined in a linear fashion, even though it's not a straight line anymore. It's something multidimensional and weird. So it's usually not graphable, but let's say I had two independent variables. I can create this. It's a plane. So two independent, independent variables creates a plane. One creates a straight line. Three creates a hyperplane, a four-dimensional plane. Five creates a panhyperplane. If you want to get into higher order mathematics, which you don't. Okay. So in this case, let's say this would be your GPA, GPA score, this would be your English score, and this would be your physics score. So using English and physics combined, you get a plane that represents what your predicted GPA is. Now, the more axes we have, the closer we get to something resembling real life. Because real life is multi axial Your time in jail is made up of all factors, not just two factors. So very quickly, we get into a multidimensional problem. And I advise you not to try to, to visualize it. It's not perfect. So nobody does this kind of regression by hand. Right? That's, you know, maybe 60 years ago would have made you do it, and you've been very upset. And you know, not very good. So we won't be doing these computations in class, but I want you to know what it is again when you use it. Because you've got computers now. Okay. This is a, a, a class of statistics called multivariate statistics, multiple variable statistics. Again, there's a whole host of multivariate statistics. We touched upon already with ANOVAs, because with ANOVAs you can have you know, a three uh, an N-way ANOVAs, which are multivariable as well. Some people call it multivariable statistics rather than multivariate. I'm actually one of those people who calls it multivariable statistics, but the textbook says multivariate, so we'll stick with that. And it is probably uh, the most common way to explore complicated phenomena, especially in health sciences. So one of my graduate students here, she heard this was um, predicting uh, the BMI of slum-dwelling Indian women based upon a variety of characteristics. So she looked at their caste, their age, their marital status, their income, uh, how much of certain nutrients they take, what about their TV, uh, how long they have to travel, uh, the distance from all those things to use to predict her, their you know, BMI is, right, by mass index. It was fascinating. So using this technique, she was able to figure out that the um, variables that had the biggest coefficients, that had the biggest impact on the model, were things like caste and whether or not you had a TV. Isn't that amazing? If you've got a TV, you have a much um, higher BMI than not, which can be all kinds of things. Not, yeah, some theories are probably already. Right. Among the theories is if you've got a TV, you're probably sitting still a lot, and you're probably fatter, as the obvious one. If you're living in a slum, no one's really sitting still a whole lot. What's actually happening is if you've got a TV, you're probably of higher income, and you're probably affording better foods and things like that as well. But the beauty of the multivariable uh, method is that you can control for those factors. So if I've got income, as well as what you've got a TV in there, I can't say now 
that the TV influence is caused by the income, because the income is there already. I've separated out the influences. That's the power of a multivariate method. Is I can figure out the um, influence of a certain factor having control for everything else. Because yeah. um, that teases out exactly mathematically, quantitatively, how much weight each factor has in the outcome that I care about. So multiple regression is an extension of simple linear regression, which is a couple dimensions above, and allows more variable. As I said, it's great for health, uh, health researchers. This is the general formula again. Our predicted y is one constant plus a variety of linear expressions. Okay. Uh, yeah, All right, so let's go let's look at our prison population. We have Bob, Frank, Earl, and Dan. We have a way of predicting your time in prison based upon your attitude. Let's say now we have another factor, let's say their height. Let's say you can predict the time in prison based upon their height. Why not? Okay. We can do anything, by the way. Multivariable statistics are so much fun that they can create relationships that don't actually exist. I said, uh, I first taught this class the first, the first time a few years ago. I had a student who decided to test it out. Let's, let's see if we can predict who's going to win the biggest loser. They talked about already. Use this technique. And, yeah, we could. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Maybe he's a fluke. You know, we'll, we'll, I stopped watching the show, so I'm not sure. But we should try it out again and see if we can do it. We should do that. We should, let's check along. Yeah, so we can use, we can use the equation that we figured out to predict this year's winners. That would be interesting. So, um, <laughs> you can't do any shows. Okay. So let's predict the time served based upon both attitude and height. You can't. Again, we're not going to do the math. Let's let SPSS do the math. And they did it this way. So we have a constant, and they figured out attitude has this effect, and height has that effect. So these are the slopes of each of these. Notice both of these slopes are negative. So we're still going down that way. Right. And this shows the p-value for each of these contributions. Typically, we'd use the, the size of the p-value to figure out whether or not some of these factors are more pertinent than others. Don't worry about that right now. But this is the equation that we get. Time in prison equals this constant minus 0.99 times your attitude minus 1 times your height. In other words, the taller you are, the less time they spend in prison. So height has a bigger influence than attitude score in lower prison time. That number is very It's made. Obviously, it's fake data. It's not true. But if this was real, it would be, uh, you know, we can find out something instantly interesting about the world, about the relationships, see which has the biggest influence. Now, even though it looks like height is more important than attitude score, and it is mathematically, it depends on the units. Okay, so let's say height here is in centimeters. If I changed it to meters, this number would drop down because suddenly each incremental change in meters would not be as impressive. So I have to keep in mind the units that I'm using in this one. That's a nuance that, you know, I'm not going to test you on, but keep in mind that it's not as simple as that. It takes a lot of, again, human input and intelligence and qualitative uh, perspective to understand what's really going on here. Now, that is a linear relationship, and that is a linear relationship. So multiple regression is a combination of linear relationships. That's why it's multiple linear regression. Right? Now, the numbers are not the same as when we didn't have height in there. Remember? Remember when we did this uh, a few minutes ago? It was, I forgot what the constant was, 64, minus 64, minus 0.64, and I think this was, what, 80 something? Okay. So numbers have changed. Why have the numbers changed? You would think if I added height, it would it's simply a matter of slapping on a new variable, a new, a new coefficient. But no, height has changed everything. Why is that? Well, think about it. I'm saying that I predicted the time in prison based upon based upon attitude score. I got something. Now it's not going to be a perfect measurement. There are other things involved there that are created by residuals. And the residuals is, is the difference between what I predict and what I get. So those other things involved are now attempting to account for. One of those other things involved is height. So now I've tightened my line a little bit. By tightening the line, I've changed the way in which attitude, uh, uh, the extent to which attitude predicts time in prison. It's not just adding more, it's height as well. The relationship is synergistic. 
also, this is no longer a straight line. This is a multi-dimensional plane, three-dimensional plane. So this no longer describes the relationship on the y-axis. This describes it on the y-axis relative to the z-axis. Okay, so if I were to add a new variable, let's say I'm adding weight. Why not? Heavy people less time in prison, let's say that. Okay? These numbers would change again. Every time I add another variable, numbers change. They get a little more precise. Now, theoretically, I can add everything I know, try to get as tight a predictor as possible this globular, multidimensional thing. And I will get closer and closer and closer. But every time I add something, I actually get less close. I get closer, but the amount I got close is smaller. So it's a lot diminishing return there. I can't lose value the more I add things. So I, I want to have a parsimonious model, the word is. Parsimonious means I want as few as possible that gets the job done. Okay. So remember, we had the correlation coefficient, R. In multiple regression, we have something similar. We have a multiple correlation coefficient. That's capital R. Before it was small r, this is capital R. Actually, small rho is capital rho, if you about the Greek and all. But keep that distinct in your minds, because they're similar. They have some interesting differences. So, oops, back in there. All right, so capital R summarizes or explains how much variance those two variables now how much they account for our, 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 our other variable. So remember that R varies from minus 1 to 0.1. I have a minus correlation. R, capital R doesn't. Capital R goes from 0 to 1. It does not become negative. That's a key distinction. Mostly because we're dealing now with multidimensional planes, and it's hard to imagine what a negative number means in multidimensions. Okay. So again, much like the correlation coefficient, we mostly report capital R squared. Through papers, is multiple regression, people obsess over the R squared value. And it means the same thing. R squared is the proportion of variance in the dependent variable accounted for by the predictor taken all together, taken as a set. So every time I add a new variable, my R squared goes up a little bit. So that's why I keep on adding them. But they go up a little bit. The weird thing is, it never goes. Let's say that. Okay. The R cannot be lower than the highest one there is. Okay, what does that mean? It means that it can't go down. So let's say I start out with my time in prison is a function of attitude score. Again, R value. I slap on height onto that. Again, another R value. It can never go down. It can only go up. It can never go less than the highest R that's in, independently associated there. So in other words, every time I add a variable, I'm adding value. I'm never losing value. But how much value, that's what we get in the parsimonious uh, arguments. Okay. Okay. So obviously, capital R is to multiple regression, but small r is to linear regression. But it is not Pearson correlation coefficient. It's something else. So if you think of it this way, just like simple regression is a special case of multiple regression, Small r is a special case, big R. Big R is the real thing. Small r is a convenient special case of big R. It's like um, general relativity and Newtonian physics. If that doesn't confuse you more than it should, <laughs> that's why I think about it. So Newtonian physics is, you know, I press on the accelerator of my gas and I go a certain distance. That's great. General relativity says, that's not really true. It's actually happening is as you go faster, space is compressing, and you're approaching the light. And all the time slows down, all those stuff that you don't notice because it doesn't matter. In in our immediate case, pressing on the gas and going faster does the job. So big R is general relativity. Small R is stepping on the gas and going faster. I've not confused you more, but I should have tonight. Okay, forget all that previous stuff. Today, by the way, is the hundredth anniversary of the discovery of general relativity. Yay, science. Okay. Uh, how we assess the goodness of fit of a multiple regression is by assessing the coefficient of multiple determination, or R squared. That's another way of saying the coefficient of multiple regression, or the same term, capital R squared. So again, capital R squared is the fraction of variance in the variable, in the dependent variable explained by a set of the other variables. Okay. Now, SPSS will give you this kind of output. Here is our R. Here is the R squared. 0.75, very high. 75% of the variance 
in time in prison is explained by height and attitude score. Don't worry about this. This is another thing entirely. Adjusted R squared. That's a whole other system of conversation. Okay. But if you use an, an SPSS, as I hope you do, I hope you play with this. You'll find that stuff. Okay. Things, the assumptions that underline multiple regression. Um, like linear regression, there's an assumption of normality, meaning that the individual variables that you're selecting are, if not um, normally distributed, there is a the central limit theory applies. So the sampling means normally distributed. It's possible, as I mentioned, to have a variable uh, in your predictive set that's not continuous. Because I said my student was mod modeling BMI versus age, num uh, whether or not you have a T, which is dichotomous, uh, your cast, which is categorical, and other things. It's possible. We don't like to do that. It's possible, so long as other variables are continuous. It doesn't like it, but you know, we can do it. Assuming linearity, meaning that each individual predictor variable has a linear relationship with the outcome. So time in prison versus attitude is linear. Time in prison versus height is linear. Time in prison versus weight is linear. Each independent one is linear. And this thing called homoscedasticity, a word I mentioned before, I don't think I defined it before. Homoscedasticity just means that we assume that um, the variability of the variance in each of the scores are somewhat the same. So the variance in each of the predictor variables are somewhat the same. Right. We're also assuming that the errors are independent. So again, those residuals, they're not dependent on each other. One way to explore the error is to do a, what's called a residual scatter plot. Looks like this. All this shows is for each of the values of my line that I create, each of the points in my model that I create, if I were to plot the value of the residual, remember the residual is the error. It's the difference between the actual value and my predicted value. I'll get something that looks like this. It looks like a mess to you. I know. This is how you interpret this. If they look randomly around zero, they're like more or less home, uh, uh, equally distributed across that central line, then we can say it's probably a linear relationship. Good. If they are somewhat horizontal, meaning, yeah, it's random, but there's a band going left and right, then we can say that the variances are probably equal. In other words, there's homoscedasticity. And if we can say that not, nothing stands out really, there's not one guy over here, right? everyone stands there, then we can say there are probably no outliers. So this is an easy way of quickly ascertaining in a multiple regression, or even linear regression, whether the assumptions underlying regression have applied. So in an exam, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask you individual things like this or show you graph of it. I'll just ask you, you know, what's a technique for measuring, for determining if, there are, um, if these conditions for linear regression have been ascertained, you can say, well, we can measure the distribution of the residuals, that kind of thing. Yeah. So. Okay. so again, if you want to use an SPSS, you can follow this, uh, these steps here. Um, have I talked to you about PSPP, Open Source SPSS? I think I mentioned it again. So if you want to continue playing with the software when the when lap time is available or when your, um, your license expires, you can download for free the open access version of SPSS. It's called PSPP because they think you're so clever. And uh, it's, it's, it works almost exactly the same way. Okay, we're done. See you after.